Okay, everyone, let's start. So, hey, guys. Yesterday, we stopped at dye hybrid. Dye hybrid crosses. And I, I don't know if you caught the last part. But the idea is that um, Mendel did the same thing with dye hybrid cross. The same thing that he did with mono hybrid. Uh, but this time is two different genes, yeah? Instead of just T here, or just tall and short, there is now P, which is purple or white flowers. Big P is purple. Purple is a dominant phenotype, whereas white flowers are a recessive phenotype. And after crossing, I want to go back a little bit here. After crossing, Purebred with purebred, you would end up with heterozygous offspring for both genes. Okay, so F1 is heterozygous for both genes, and you cross two he heterozygous plants. Only if you cross two heterozygous plants, really, you end up with the F2 generation, which shows a 9 3 3 1 ratio. And yesterday I showed you how to complete the dihybrid cross. Um, just so you know, this triangle technique only works if you arrange the gametes in order from most dominant, dominant to dominant front, dominant back, and like no dominant at all. So in order of dominance, uh, only works if it, you put it this way. And also, this obviously only works, only produce, this ratio only produce when two heterozygotes or two genes are crossed. If the question gives you a slightly different scenario, then the likelihood is that the entire planet square will look very, very different. Okay, so don't simply draw this for fun. Also, the triangles are for you to see. Um, the examiners don't want to see the triangles. In fact, they'll be really confused if they see your triangle. So don't draw the triangles for them. Just draw it in your head, okay? It's just a little technique. Now, um, let's come to a conclusion, uh, not a conclusion, but, but like an explanation for what is going on in this tree, in these two different things, right? Monohybrid cross and dihybrid cross. What is it that made these two crosses so famous? What did it prove? So this is what it proved here. There are three law laws that uh, Mendel has submitted, but obviously he used different words. La. Same thing he explained in his original paper, but different words. Why? Because Mendel didn't even know what genes and chromosomes are yet, so he came up with his own terms for that. But essentially, he was talking about genes and alleles and chromosomes. Anyways, um, three laws. Number one is the law of segregation. Okay, The law of segregation is the idea that, well, the diploid cells will form gametes using meiosis. And during meiosis, alleles for each gene segregate from each other. So each gamete only carries one allele for each gene. Okay? Think about um, think about how we how we draw gametes, right? Like this. I did say that this is four four chromosomes, right? So this is the haploid number here two chromosomes each. Okay, and you realize that big T will always be separated from small t, and big P will always be separated from small p. Okay, so that is the law of segregation. The idea that the alleles, alle al well, hang on, throw my phone away. Right, alleles for each gene are separated when gamete are formed. So each gene only carries one allele for each gene. Okay, the next law is the law of independent absorption. Now this is, uh, this should be familiar to you by now. We have learned this and talked about it a few times. And that's the idea that, hey, that each pair lines up independently of others on the equator. So it could be blue, red, blue, red, or it could be blue, red, red, blue. Okay, it could be a different way around. If this is if it has four chromosomes. What if it has like, you know, like maybe 10 chromosomes, then they would have many, many different, different arrangements. But in the context of Mendelian genetics, in the context of dye hybrid, you can see here how the arrangement actually influences the gametes as well. So let me use my pen here. Okay, this is uh, at, this is meta, after metaphase one, actually this is uh, during metaphase two, you can imagine maybe 
uh, the cell would split right here. So this, this cell here is going to result with um, what you see here is G, big G, big W. This is small g, tiny W. Or depending on the arrangement here, if it's a different arrangement, it could result in big G, small w, or small g, big w. So you can see the gametes would differ based on how it's independently absorbed. Okay, that's why when the phenotype is small g, small g, uh, big g, small g, big w, small w, a heterozygous phenotype, you can have four different gametes that, 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 um, that may be formed. Okay. All right, so that's the law of independent absorption. Number three is the law of dominance. Now, this is the easiest law ever. Right, it's the idea that some are dominant and some others are recessive. So maybe uh, what we have seen so far the example is big T and small t. So the tall allele is, is dominant, whereas the short allele is recessive. So that's what um, the process have proved, actually. Yeah, I don't know I'm raising, but dihybrid and monohybrid cross proves these three laws. Just say. Okay. Anyways, that's all we have to do with melanin and genetics. Uh, by the way, PS, we do not need to memorize this so much. It doesn't count that often, but I think this is sort of like a like um <clears throat> understanding sort of slide. Okay, you need to understand why it proves. Okay, anyways, uh, I, I was worrying you don't remember what happened exactly yesterday. So I'm just going to pop up a question here and maybe you can comment in the chat what genotypes do you think these would, this would result in? Just like casually type in the chat so that I know you know what happened yesterday. Oh wait, the genotypes are already up there. What talking you? Let's let's say um let's let's come up with another question. Can you tell me um what ratio you expect? And how does that rest? So if you have set the ratio, please tell me what phenotypes are involved there. So ratio and few types. Chat, please. Everyone, please. Anyone. No need to draw the J diagram. No need to draw. Just type in chat. Right, so nitro tree one, great. Good job. It's the same idea because what, what it's saying is, OK, two heterozygous parents are crossing two heterozygous parents. So this is F1 essentially. So nitrogen one ratio, great. What are phenotypes that you would expect in relation to nitrogen one? Corresponding to nitrogen one. Right, let's check that. So yellow round, two. So is this yellow round? Yes, this is yellow round. Because yellow and round's dominant is nine. And then there is Round but green, round but green, and then crinkle but yellow, and in the end, crinkle but green. Very nice. So I hope everyone got that. Any questions so far about monohybrid and dihybrid cross before we go into a test cross? Okay, no, then we'll go on. So, um, Sorry, we haven't gone into test cross yet. I forgot one more example. So that one, you can just look at it and realize what the ratio is. But um, sometimes the comprehension question goes beyond that and tries to describe to you what is going on. So um, here's a question. And now you have to draw a genetic diagram. <laughs> OK, everyone. Again, this is a practice, practice um, chapter. If you don't move your hands, and your brains to do actively learn something. Uh, you're gonna be very lost during the exam. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to do this in one note. Uh, is it too tiny? Hang on. So I have it cross. Make sure you have this down. Um, I asked you to draw six or seven yesterday projection diagrams. Um, I think you should have completed at least five so far. Right? Yeah, five. This should be projection diagram number six for a dihybrid example. This one is not a dihybrid cross, it's not the experiment, but it follows the same rules. And therefore it's called dihybrid inheritance. So again, don't forget your formatting. Yeah, don't forget to cross. Don't forget to circle the gametes. Uh, when, when you're done, let me know in the chat so we can move on with this. So I like to start with black, but like red, too aggressive. Ah, nice cute color. Let big R equals I feel like I'm less confused like this. I don't know why they use the word crinkled and not wrinkled. Beats me. Can't tell why. It is what it is. Realize how I write the Y differently if it's capital and small letter. It's not, um, yeah, you get a bit confused. I don't like this color anymore. Let me try to change. Done. Need to draw nice, nice la. If you don't let me know in the chat, yeah. How, miss how you know is crossed with crinkled green because it says it's homozygous recessive for both traits. And the recessive phenotype for both traits is crinkled and green. Or I should write crinkled green, not green crinkled. I'm not confused here. Yeah? 
So you do have to, in, um, in genetics question, you, your brain needs to move quite quickly. You need to form those connections really well. Um, that's why we started off last class with, you know, terminology and what it means, because of course you know what it means, but when it's in a big long sentence and a big paragraph, um, you may get scared a little bit. And it's very important to just hang on to the stuff you know, okay? Okay, I don't know if you're done or not. Um, I'm going to give you another two minutes and I'm just going to discuss. Let me know if you're done. I did start it out for you if you needed some help. Again, don't expect it to be like our dihybrid cross example because it's an experiment, right? This is uh, the same principles apply, but the cross is different. This is not the same cross. If you realized already, you, you really cannot um, memorize anything here. You do need to know how to do the procedure. You do need to understand what is going on. If not, you read the question, you'll be really lost. So if you have a problem and you don't understand it, you can type it in the chat and answer, or you can message me personally so I can help you out. Um, Better if you don't understand now, you tell me now because it will get more complicated next class. Okay, I'll give you one more minute and we'll discuss. I hope you're actually doing it. Um, is it 4444? Is there a simplified ratio? You must use a pencil for the lines, but everything in writing needs to be in pen. And it should be yes, one 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 ratio. That's correct. So um one minute's up, so I'm just gonna show you how it's done now. So this is heterozygous, right? And um the gametes would have four different ones, big R and then big Y, okay, remember the circle, and then there'll be big R and small y, and then there's small r and big Y. And then there is small r, small y. Right, 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 right. I don't know why you said that. Okay, and then the next one is homozygous recessive. And as you see, the two r's are the same, the two y's are the same. The only possible to meet is small r, small y. Notice how I use a different writing for y and not like this because. Again, you want the big letter and the small letter to look different so that you're not confused. Okay, you want it to look different. So you, what happens to your Punnett square? Okay, <clears throat> I like to do it longer rather than shorter, but that's all up to you. Um, obviously, I don't have a ruler at the moment. I don't know how a physics teacher do it so fast. It's insane, but... Um, I'm just gonna simply draw here. All right, so one organism, one, one, one fellow, one would be one row like this. Okay, and then the other one would be like this, but as just one, right? Make sure you complete all the, the lines. There is marks for this drawing these lines. Draw using pencil <clears throat> so you can erase if it's ugly, you know. And with this, you can start start writing. Okay. Okay, big R, big Y, and then this is small, small, big, small, this is small, 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 small. Okay, then don't forget to write down the phenotype. So we have a uh, round and yellow. Can I change color of my pen? Yes, I can. Round and yellow. And at this point, we have round and green. We have crinkle and yellow and round. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Crinkle and green. So you're right. It's a one to one to one ratio. Now, um, 
in cases like this, you realize how I space the ones out to align with align with the table and that's because I don't want to write again. I don't want to write this again. I don't want to write round yellow again to round green because you, you have to tell them what the, the phenotypes are and what the ratio means, right? So it's just too much trouble. Just just write there 1111 aligning with the table. Uh, Husna asks, in the exam, do we write the phenotypes in the table too? Um, I think it's a good practice. You should. If not, you have to write it outside the table. And you need to link the genotype together with the phenotype. So in your neck, if you separate it, means you have to write this again. And then make a whole list. And that's just too much trouble. Just writing a table, it saves you a lot of trouble. Okay. In the exam, the gametes need to circle the table. Yes, your gametes all need to be circled in the table and outside the table. Both also have to circle. Okay, don't forget the cross as well here. Very easy to miss. This little cross. Okay, so that is the hybrid inheritance example three. Example three because there have been two examples um, before that. Um, if you refer to a one note, you can see all this stuff. Let's go on to the next part a little bit more before we can move on to chi-squared. So this is all about test cross again. Yay! So the idea is you're walking through a random field and you found a tall purple flower pea plant. And this is, um, this is what do you call? This is um, dominant phenotypes, right? So it could be heterozygous or homozygous dominant for that particular gene. So how do you determine its genotype? Again, it's a test cross. And what is a test cross? A test cross is to cross individual homozygous recessive for both genes. So again, test cross is always you cross with an individual that is homozygous recessive. That means small letters, small letters, small letters, small letters. Okay, in this case, it's dihybrid, means there are two genes involved. So, homozygous recessive for both genes, lah, not just one, both. Okay, so in this case, it's a short white plant that we want to cross it with. Okay. Small t, small t, small p, small p. And obviously, just like more hybrid, different ratios of different phenotypes in offspring will reveal the genotype. Okay, so what are possible genotypes for a tall purple flower plant. You must realize that there is a lot because now there are two genes and means addition, um, it, it, it will be additional complexity, right? It could be all homozygous dominant, both homozygous dominant, both heterozygous, or one homozygous dominant, one heterozygous. These are all tall purple flower genotypes. We don't think there's any, any other possibilities. So let's go each case and see what we will get for each case. Okay, so if it's big T, big T, big P, big P, and you're crossing it with a homozygous recessive plant for both genes, um, you're going to get this, right? This is going to end up with this gamete. This is the only gamete possible, and this is the only gamete possible for, the, uh, for this one. Right, so if you cross it, you realize that all your offspring is tall and purple. So this is easy. What if it's heterozygous? Now we just did the heterozygous one, all right? We just did this very similarly, right? Heterozygous cross with homozygous recessive for both genes. Okay. So what do you think the gametes are? And what ratio would it be? So since we already just did a very similar cross, okay, I'm gonna move to one note. Okay, this is for you to fill in, by the way, if you printed the slides. Um, you can sketch a little bit on your on your paper as well, but this is not a genetic diagram. This is a probability thing. Okay, not spoiler one more now. Okay, let's focus on this one on the top first. <clears throat> just like we did just now, there will be four, 
this this fella will give us four different gametes. Big T, big P, big T, small P, small T, big P, and small T, small P. Resulting in a one, one, one ratio. So I don't even need to complete this to find out, but I'm going to complete it because some people need to see it, right? So it's okay. It's okay. I'm visual too. It's okay. Let's complete it. Let's also write down the phenotype. So this one is tall and purple. This is tall and white flowers. This is tall. Oh, sorry. This is short, but purple flowers. And this is short and white flowers. Yeah, just to write down. So the ratio you should expect is one, 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 one. And there are four different phenotypes here that you expect. So basically all the phenotypes, you expect to have all the phenotypes in a one to one to one to one ratio. Of course, you do need to do this test for a lot, a very high number in order to get something close to this ratio. But you know that it's four different offsprings uh, are possible. They are possible to get. OK, so you get the drift. Uh, I'm going to give you some time to think and process because I realize that, yeah, we all need that in the morning, a little bit extra time. So I'm just going to leave it here and let you figure out for a few minutes before I come back. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to answer Yongi's question. Yongi said, can I write P, pheno bracket phenotype, instead of the probability of the phenotype is? Uh, yes, yes, you can. So probability bracket purple, comma, white equals, a eh, tall, comma, white equals, can. Like maths, right? That's fine. I think uh, as long as you're understandable, you're good to go for the formatting of the probability and the ratio thing. Okay, a few more minutes to stare at the screen and um, realize why it's the, the realize how to get that particular 50%, 50% thing. Okay, you can do that by completing the Punnett square in your head. I think that's good training. Or maybe some, if you need to write it down, that's fine. So scribble it down on a separate piece of paper, that's okay. I'll give you another minute. So um, this fella here, we need to figure out its gametes. So big T, big T is already set. So the two different gametes will be just big T, big P, and big T, small p. The T doesn't have a choice, you see. So resulting is like this. So because big T is always there, you always have tall plants. All plants will be tall. but Half will be purple and half will be white. A very similar issue here because big P, big P, no choice now, right? So it's big T, big P, or small T, big P. Big P is always there. So when you do your cr test cross, you end up with always purple flowers, all offspring will have purple flowers, but one is tall purple, one is short purple. I feel like these statements don't come as naturally, not don't come as quickly. I feel like it's easier to like simply sketch this little Punnett square aside, especially if they don't require you to, um, whoops, to it's especially didn't require you to draw a genetic di diagram in the exam, but it just asks you the question. Uh, just sketch it in your mind, sketch this little Punnett square in a side so that uh, you can better phrase your answers so that this
can result in explanations like this. So you use the information planet square in order to come up with descriptions like this, not the other way around. Okay. It's some sort of like working. Right, so that test cross. Um, what do you do then if you have found a tall purple flower pea plant in a random field? You don't know its genotype, what do you do? You take it, you cross it with an individual that's homozygous recessive for both genes, aka all the small letter fellas, right? All the, the one with recessive phenotype. You cross it, you look at the offspring, the ratio, the, the number of phenotypes. Are all the offspring tall? But some white some purple. Or are all offspring only have purple flowers, 50% 50% tall, 50% short? Or does it show all the different phenotypes? Or does it only show tall and purple phenotypes? Then from there, from these different phenotypes of the offspring, different ratios in the phenotypes of the offspring, this will reveal, you can work out, okay, what is the original genotype of the one plant you found. I hope that is clear. If you have any questions, you can put in the chat. Right, the next question moves on from the dihybrid idea and talks about trihybrid inheritance. What if three genes are involved? Whoa, that's crazy. Okay, I already have it here written down in the slides, um, but I hope you, you can actually write it down here as well in your seven. Yeah, this should be your seven genetic diagram or maybe six genetic diagram. I didn't count, let me count. How many do you write? Draw. All right, so two, two, one, this is five, six. Yeah, this is number seven genetic diagram. If you, that should be drawn in your notes already. So this is tri hybrid inheritance. Okay, technically, this is not like a thing. Like, it's not called tri hybrid inheritance. They just give you la, uh, three genes and give you a description of three, three genes. And this is just um, the same the same few genes that we talked about, but at the round. So now we have tall, short, purple, white, round P, and crinkled P. And what we're going to do is we are going to cross this fella with this fella. Now, I know the answers are there, but pretend you didn't see, okay? And you're going to try and do this cross for yourself and um, practice it for yourself. Okay, it's quite interesting because now it has three different genes. That means six alpha, six letters here. This is a diploid number. Uh, make sure the gametes is six divide two, which is three. You can figure out the possibilities in the gametes. I feel like it's very hard to see what's going on here. I might write it down. I feel like if you look at it, you're like, oh, of course. But when you do it, it might feel very different. So yeah, please, please try it. This is the question, essentially. This is tall, purple, and brown. This is tall, white and crinkle. Okay, try and let me know when you're done. I'll give you a few minutes.
and go sneeze, you try and do it, yeah? Tell me if you're done in the chat, please. Uh, just a reminder that the P's are quite confusing, as you can see. So make sure your big P's are actually really big, the small P's really tiny to differentiate them, and not you get really confused. I know I keep saying that, but I'm saying it because it's a common mistake. Don't forget to draw the X as well. Circle the gametes. Let me know if you're done. Someone's done. I assume most people are sort of done ish. Okay, again, here you have, let's discuss, you know, you have six, six different letters here. This is a diploid number. You undergo meiosis, so you form a gamete with three different letters instead of six. So called six divide two. Okay. And also um, one of each letter. So one. When a uh, allele per gene here. So you realize that P, big P and big P are the same. So there's no difference. There's no variation here. There's no difference here, right? Uh, but there's big T and small T to pick from, and big R and small R to pick from. So you have big T. Right, let's have big T, big P. No choice. Big R first. Right, what else can big T with? Big T, big P, no choice. Small r, that could be another gamete. Let's try small t. Small t, big P, no choice, right? Big R. And then, oh, I'm realizing I'm writing, saying it. Small t, big P, and then small r. That one was quite ugly. <laughs> I drew that big P really big. Uh -huh, never mind. So um, that's the gametes for this fella. Right, these three fellas, very convenient. These two are the same, these two are the same, and these two are the same. Means they don't have much to separate. They don't have any other choice anyway. Right, so it's just big T, small P, small R. There's no other gametes other than these three. So I think that's how um, you figure it out. Now, they can make it more complicated for you. And it just means that you have to add another two gametes here, or three. Actually, yes, they'll be, yeah. They can make it more complicated for you. They can put even more choice. They can change the genotype here in order to make it more. So um, heterozygous for all of those things would make it a more complex sort of Punnett square. But um, generally speaking, the exam doesn't torture you that much regarding three genes. They're quite nice. So I gave you a nice example to work on as well. So TPR, maybe I won't be so nice in exercise, right? I'll we'll figure it out. Right, just copying back what we know. 
Oh no, it's really ugly. Oh no, it's really, really ugly. Oh no! Okay, let me zoom out. Everything zoomed out looks fine. Okay, sorry. I'll just bring this fella over. Okay, a bit better. Fine with me. I can live with that. I hope you can. Okay, I didn't even draw the lines because too ugly. Okay, the more complicated Punnett square is, the neater your lines need to be. Okay, now you can complete all this and you can label it accordingly. I think it's quite okay, starting now. Um, with complicated ones, with complicated Punnett squares, I really like to employ the technique we learned yesterday. So we know that this TPR is common throughout, so I'm going to space, space, small piece behind R. Okay, so T big space, small space. T big space, small space. T big space, small space. Okay, and then add the rest in. Just to save some time. I feel like it helps. Oh, shucks. Don't swear, class to Jane. Okay. Oh, I missed one more space. Should be one more space here. Thanks. No, no, it shouldn't be. My bad. It's correct, it's correct. Where were we? Okay, continue. You can do this any method you want. I feel like it's one row, so it's not as bad as the die hybrid the other day. So this would be tall, purple, and round, which is tall, purple, and crinkled. This is tall, I'm trying to pause and think, purple round, this is tall, purple, crinkled. Is that right? Yeah, it is right. I just need to check because brain lag in the morning. So we here have very interesting. I don't know why I wrote it that way, but um, you can see here that I also can write it as tall, purple, round, two, tall, purple, crinkle is one, two, one. Or I can write, okay, it's two, 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 which is one, two, one, right? Because this and this is the same, this and this is the same. So this is what you should get. Um, alternatively, you can write it like this. All are tall and have purple flowers. Obviously, this ratio is problematic. It's one to one. Uh -huh. Mistakes in the slides. Always find. I always find them later on. I will edit this later on and upload uh, updated slides. But all are tall and all have purple flowers. 50% round, 50% purple. It is a one to one ratio. Okay, I hope that answers your questions. And with that, we're pretty much done with mono hybrid and die hybrid, and we're ready to move on to sky chi squared. Now we're going to take a little short break. We'll come back at 9 o'clock and we'll start chi squared. Please prepare your brains to match a little bit. If any questions, put them in the chat. Okay, see you at 9 o'clock. Let me edit my slides and re-upload them right now.
very big file because it's a very big chapter.